Welcome everybody here at the Maxon booth on the IBC 2015. Welcome Internet. I see there are very much people uh, looking or watching our presentations. And we've got a great lineup of speakers here. And the next one is a motion graphics director of the big company MPC London. And he's going to give you an insight of how Cinema 4D is fitting in their workflow while they're doing um, things for their customers. So let's give a great and warm and big also at the same time welcome to William McNeil. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, like Len said, my name is Will, and I am a motion graphics designer and director at a company called MPC in London. MPC, uh, we're a big company, a big international studio. We're based all around the world. Uh, we have offices uh, in India, North America, and in Europe. Um, we do all sorts of different work at these places. Uh, some of them are doing uh, visual effects for film, some visual effects for commercials. Um, we're also branching into uh, digital content applications. We uh, are also looking at uh, producing content for virtual reality. I work in our London office most of the time. I also occasionally work in our Amsterdam office. One thing that's interesting uh, about working here in Amsterdam is that uh, while I'm at my desk in Amsterdam, I'm actually using the same computer that I use in London. All our hardware is stored in London, uh, and we use it remotely, which is a nice feature. Um, a bit about what we do. We uh, are heavily involved in film visual effects and motion graphics. Uh, this is a still from Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, MPC was one of the principal visual effects studios, and uh, our motion graphics studio handled some of the um, motion graphics screen animation as well. We've got a few new projects coming out soon. This is um, a still from the new film uh, The Martian, made by Ridley Scott, starring Matt Damon. Great book. If you have a chance to read it, do. And of course, go see the film. Um, the Jungle Book, uh, we're doing a new version of The Jungle Book, which is um, about 90% CG with a little bit of uh, live action. The Mowgli character is, uh, is played by a real little boy. Everything else is computer generated, um, and it looks amazing. There's a trailer you can watch now. We're also involved in commercials. Uh, we're known for making creatures do things that nature never intended, like ponies that moonwalk, cats that can sing, and uh, babies that rock out on roller skates. We also uh, are getting into uh, new types of content. This is a still from a film called Catatonic. Well, actually, it's not a film. It's um, a virtual reality experience. Uh, this is something you see wearing a virtual reality headset, like an Oculus Rift. That's pretty gruesome. Uh, and um, basically, you're taken on a 15-minute journey through a mental asylum. Um, it's very scary. Speaking of scary, this is our team. We are the Motion Graphics Studio in London. Um, a few of those guys, uh, obviously, we added in this photograph later. Um, unlike the rest of MPC in Motion Graphics, we are people who uh, work across all parts of our production, from the initial creative brief to the final delivery. You might normally see uh, someone in another part of MPC who's very specialized, maybe does uh, fur, or uh, a compositor who specializes in doing photorealistic imagery. In our studio, everyone handles projects from the very start, from the original creative brief, right through animation, right through the final product. We're a very serious bunch. We never get out much. Um, we'd love for you to come visit us in London. If you do, just remember to bring the bare essentials. We'd be happy to see you. So here's a quick look at what we've been doing in the motion design studio. And after this, I'll talk you through some recent projects. Great.
So that's some of the projects. Thanks. <laughs> that's some of the work we've been working on recently. Uh, obviously, you can tell that's a big range of work uh, from 2D character animation right through to fully realized 3D animation, lots of visual effects, lots of particle work, that kind of stuff. That's one thing I really like about working in motion design is um, you do all kinds of work from day to day, and you get to do work on a big variety of projects. I'm going to talk today about two projects in detail. And then at the end of that, I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to do a bit of a demo of some new software that's come out recently to work alongside Cinema 4D, the Arnold renderer. Um, so the first project I'm going to talk about is this one. This was a, an ad for the French cognac maker Martel. Uh, but it's actually an ad that was going to be shown in, or that is being shown in Nigeria. Uh, it came out about two weeks ago in Nigeria. I've been Googling it, trying to uh, see if I can find an example of it. Unfortunately, the name Martel tends to bring up more links from um, Game of Thrones than it does from cognac ads. Um, what was unusual about this ad is um, that we used an application called RealFlow. Uh, nothing weird about that, but uh, it's a bit of a new venture for us. RealFlow is a uh, fluid simulator um, and a dynamic simulation uh, simulator. It can create all kinds of different um, particle effects for realistic simulations of uh, fluid and smoke. Um, we used it uh, outside of C4D, but uh, pretty soon the makers of RealFlow, Next Limit, are introducing a version of RealFlow that will work inside C4D, which is quite exciting. Um, you wonder, wonder why we used RealFlow? Well, here's a version of the ad, so you can have a look for yourself. We start with a shot of tradition, an ounce of passion, then we add a splash of curiosity and a dash of refinement, squeezing a few drops of humor and then shake it up with some generosity. Serve in good company with a slice of the unforgettable. Drink it slowly. Martel. Food. So that's our um, ad for Martel. Just to put things into perspective, that ad was made um, principally by two people, myself and another animator called Filiberto Ciernelli, um, over about four weeks. Um, now, that was actually quite a quick, quick turnaround for this project. When we started, we didn't think that we would be able to do it in that short a time. Uh, so what we thought about doing instead first was using a lot of uh, stock footage of cognac or other fluids being poured into glasses and whatnot, and then manipulating that in uh, a program like After Effects or Shake or Nuke, sorry, not Shake, Nuke, um, to try to make that do what we wanted it to do. Uh, we started doing tests with this, and we realized pretty quickly that that actually was going to be harder than simulating the fluids from scratch. So uh, I started to panic a little bit and trying to figure out what we were going to do to get this done in the amount of time we had. And I just started playing with RealFlow. So this is a very simple simulation in RealFlow. It's basically just a, a 3D letter filling up with fluid. Um, it's nothing special. You can see it doesn't really look like fluid filling up, but it, rendered, or it simulated very quickly. It took about a minute to simulate this. Um, so I started experimenting a little bit more with uh, cranking up the, uh, the options in RealFlow. So the main uh, feature or the main uh, setting you want to change in RealFlow to get your fluids looking more interesting is the resolution. And you can see here I've gone from 1 on the left to 20 on the right. Simulation times go up here. Processing time goes up. But we're still looking at about five minutes per letter. So I realized doing this that actually what I could build was a font of 3D fluid letters. Um, so basically every letter that we were going to need to build all this text we could simulate once and then use again and again. We also discovered that in um, some cases, we would have some letters uh, that were identical next to each other. So we might have two S's right next to each other. But simply by offsetting the simulation time, we could create uh, an effect that made those letters look unique. So look here at the word passion. Those two S's are the same simulations. We've just um, offset their timing a little bit. For some of our simulations, uh, we needed something that was bespoke for that particular shot. Uh, so the word slice here, we, um, we did that as one simulation that we ran overnight. I said that the most of our text we simulated at a resolution in real flow of 20. We ran this at 120. That's why you get these really nice little tendrils of fluid moving. 
and um, all that great little detail in there. Um, one thing we did notice, though, is if you simulate in RealFlow, you can do a test at low resolution, then up-res that to higher resolution, run that overnight, think that's going to be the same. It isn't necessarily. It's a bit like you left the tap on in the bathroom overnight. You come in in the morning, and there's fluid is exploded everywhere in your simulation. One big feature that uh, we used a lot in this process um, and is something that has only recently come to C4D as part of the RealFlow pipeline is something called the uh, RealFlow Render Kit. To explain how it works, um, this is basically how we went about building this. We created these animatic uh, tests that we showed our client just to roughly show how the animation was going to work. And this just shows the timing and whatnot. So we knew in this case that this word tradition needed to fill up. So we had all our letters simulated. Basically, it was just a matter of uh, lining up the right letters next to each other and playing them back at the right time. The problem is that these simulations here don't render as they are. All these little dots here, these are particles. And they're not just little dots. They actually contain lots of information that RealFlow uses about speed and pressure, gravity, whatnot. So these on their own don't render. In order to render, you need something called a mesh. Now, RealFlow creates meshes, and that's what that is on the right. And it's basically just a blob of 3D geometry based on that, uh, those particles. The difference is that can render, that can't. Now, these meshes are very heavy. They uh, can be up to several hundred megabytes per frame. So to use them inside, Real, or inside Cinema 4D can get very cumbersome very quickly. And we were looking at having maybe 10 or 13 meshes in one scene. We needed to be able to animate them, offset their timing, position them, and whatnot. So it was impractical to bring those meshes into C4D from RealFlow. What we needed to do instead was create those meshes inside C4D. That's what the RealFlow render kit is for. Basically, this is the plugin here inside C4D. I go and grab this RealFlow RK mesh. Basically, what this allows me to do is bring particles into C4D from RealFlow and mesh them only at the time I'm going to render them. So it's a huge time saver in terms of um, being able to just do that process only when it's needed. So that's my uh, particle simulation, that long file path there. I've just offset the timing there, just basic settings about uh, how I'm going to deal with the simulation. I can stack up multiple simulations in one mesher. So for instance, my letter T had a few different simulations put together to make one. These are all the different mesh, prop mesh properties. Same thing you'd find inside RealFlow. And here you can see these are just the particles loaded into C4D. Once I have all those particles loaded in, It's just a matter of hitting render. And at that point, C4D, or the render kit, will figure out what it needs to do to mesh it. So all that time spent preparing that mesh inside RealFlow, don't have to do that anymore. Just do it all inside C4D. It was a huge time saver, and it made this project possible. Here's another quick look at the ad, and then we're going to move on to another project. We start with a shot of tradition, an ounce of passion. Then we add a splash of curiosity and a dash of refinement, squeezing a few drops of humor and then shake it up with some generosity. Serve in good company with a slice of the unforgettable. Drink it slowly. Martel, full of character. OK, thanks, guys. Uh, so that's the Martel ad. The next project I'm going to talk about is uh, for one of our big clients, Adidas. Uh, they make sporting equipment. Um, and in particular, they make uh, football boots. Um, so Adidas uh, asked us about a year ago a little over a year ago, to make a minute-long ad uh, to celebrate their new football boot uh, featuring this guy. Uh. 
beg your pardon. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Sorry. Um, before I talk about that, here are some other projects that we've done for Adidas. Basically, these ads are uh, live action football boots with lots of motion graphics added on top, a mixture of C4D tracking uh, and tracking 3D points, and then we take them into After Effects and we add lots of um, effects on top. So last year, uh, Adidas asked, to do, asked us to do something a little different and make a one-minute ad featuring this guy. His name is Misut Özil, and he is part of the German national football team. And he is also um, uh, plays for a team in England called Arsenal. Um, basically, what Adidas said is, um, we've got a boot, and we've got this player, and we want you guys to come up with the rest. So we handled this project from initial design through a shoot and into final delivery. Here's a quick look at the ad. So uh, your basic football boot ad. Um, so I, get, I said this ad started out, uh, we did the initial design. These are some images created by our uh, director, John Sunter. And basically the idea called for um, Ozil to run around and do his football thing, and all kinds of cool reptile particles and effects would be emitted from his body. It was a bit of a technical challenge, this job. Um, we knew that we needed to shoot it on green screen in order for us to be able to change the background. Uh, the client wanted us to shoot it at a very high frame rate so we could create extreme slow motion. We shot it at 1,000 frames a second, um, which also means you need an extreme amount of light. So we shot it on a massive soundstage with huge lights. We also needed to figure out how we were going to track all this stuff onto Ozil's body. So um, how were we going to get uh, realistic tracks of his motion into After Effects and Cinema 4D for us to add particles? We thought we had it all figured out when the client said, by the way, you have him for two hours. So we had our football star for two hours. So basically, at that point, we panicked. And we thought, we don't know what we're going to do. Uh, and we decided we would do some tests. So that's where this guy comes in. His name is Joe. He doesn't play football, but uh, he's watched a lot of matches on television. And basically, with Joe, we just needed to figure out how many of these uh, tracking markers we could stick on him before he basically turned into one big green sticker. Um, so we did our tests with Joe, and we wanted to know what kind of information we could pull off him as he moved around and spun around doing various uh, football tricks. We wanted to know if we could track his feet. Would we be able to track the ball? What kind of movement were we going to get? And also, what happens when he starts playing football? So we did our tests. We just did some rough animation on top of it just to figure out how well things would stick to him. We thought it worked out pretty well. Obviously, these aren't the final effects at all, just quick little things we tried out. So we headed off to our shoot uh, with a lot of good information, and we sent Joe home to take off the stickers. So here's a quick uh, look at our shoot, and I'll take you through it now. We shot at Leavesden Studios in London, which is where they shot the last few Harry Potter films. Massive soundstage. Like I said, lots and lots of lights. We had some real gra grass. We also had some AstroTurf. Um, it was a fantastic shoot.
So that was our shoot, two days shoot. We had Misut Özil for the last two hours of the second day. Um, Özil turned out to be a really uh, nice guy. He was really keen to take part, and um, he actually stayed longer than he was supposed to in order to get that scissor kick right at the end. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about the, um, the design process on this, and then uh, talk about one of the big challenges we faced. Sorry if you don't like snakes. Um, so we started out with some stock imagery of reptiles, and we were just trying to figure out how we could sort of turn this into some sort of a pattern or texture that we could put onto Ozil, 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 uh, to make him look a bit like a reptile. So we take some textures like this, and we break them down until we get sort of shapes that work sort of like a body. We just start breaking them up and then tracking them onto his body in After Effects, and um, pretty soon we get something that looks like this. Background added in, some uh, particles added from C4D, and it all looked pretty good. Uh, we used a similar technique for his face. Here's another snake texture. Basically just layering it up onto his face, giving you that look. Now, one of the big challenges we faced on this was um, something that came up after we did our shoot. The um, client said, we want shots like this. We want shots where we believe like this stuff is really on his skin, like it's all over him, like a visual effects shot. Now, we hadn't prepared for this when we were shooting it. We weren't allowed to put any tracking markers on his face. So we had to come up with a realistic way of tracking the motion of his face and adding detail uh, without any kind of markers. So we start with a shot like this one. Basically, we've got to figure out how we're going to get information from this shot um, into Cinema 4D. So we start by... Uh, looking at his original footage. Now, this shot is of Ozil. Um, it's just a dolly shot around him, shot at slow motion. And we didn't use this as a, as a shot in the film, but we used it as reference. So basically, I got a shot of him, uh, the camera dollying around him, which you'll see here in a second. And basically, he's standing still. His eyes are moving, but that doesn't matter. So what I've got actually here is several frames from different sides of his face. If I take those frames into an application called PhotoScan, I can actually use them to create a 3D model of Ozil's face. Now, what PhotoScan is assuming is that these are still photographs taken at the exact same moment from lots of different angles at once. In fact, they aren't, but because Ozil was standing still, it was pretty close to that. So it loads in all these pictures. It assumes these are all different still cameras. And it creates this thing called the point cloud. So you see here, we have this point cloud of Ozil, and you can see it's, except for the blue bits, it's a fairly realistic um, depiction of the size and shape of his face. All those little blue chips over there, those are what Photoscan thinks were original cameras, were cameras standing around him taking all that picture all at once. Now, from that 3D uh, point cloud, I can create a 3D mesh. Here's that 3D mesh taken into an application called PF Track. PF Track is a 3D tracking application, mainly used for match moving cameras. In this case, what it's doing is called a geometry track. So it's actually taking that 3D mesh that I created and trying to make it track to Ozil's face in this shot. Now, it's not doing this in a 2D way. It's actually moving this mesh in three dimensions. It can move it um, so it's rotating, transforming, and scaling this, pic this uh, 3D shape in order to stick it on there. Once I've done that, I can take that information into C4D. So this is C4D. I've got um, my mesh of Ozil. I've added some bust detail just to make it a little bit bigger. And um, I'm going to use this along with that tracking information to add detail to his face. So the first thing I need to do is set this mesh up for texturing, which just means that I'm going to um, relax the UVs so that I have a nice, uh, smooth uh, surface to texture. So basically, you'll notice that those uh, letters don't look distorted or stretched. That is how I, or numbers, sorry. That's how I know that when I add a texture to this, it's not going to be distorted or stretched either. I create something from C4D called a UV pass, which is what this looks like. And basically, it's a multicolored image that can be used in a 2D application to remap images in seemingly in 3D. So I render that out of C4D, and I take it into After Effects. Sorry, my computer seems to have frozen up here for a second.
I think we're back. Cool. OK, take that into After Effects. And um, basically, what we've got here is that three, uh, UV pass rendered out of C4D, taking it into After Effects, and just set it side by side. Now, this is picking up that tracking information from PF Track to make it move in three dimensions. And I can use an, a plugin inside After Effects called UV Remap. You'll see it here. And what this is going to do is remap an image onto that UV map, using that UV map to distort it. So basically, I've got a pre-comp down here that I'm going to tell UV remap to stick onto Urzel. It's upside down, so I'm going to flip it on the Y. And basically, it's just taking another texture, and it's wrapping it onto his face using that UV map as coordinates for it. Once I start setting up some good comp compositing uh, modes, get it looking right, you can see I can see what this is going to look like. Now, the great thing about this is doing it in After Effects is I can animate this texture at the same time. So I've got this texture over on the right-hand side. This is my pre-comp that I'm mapping onto him on the left-hand side. I can see all my animation and see what it's doing to him in 3D at the same time. The other way of doing this would have been to make some animation in After Effects, render it out, take it into C4D, apply it, render that, see what it looked like. This way, I get to do it all in the same place. So using that UV map is kind of like a bridge between 2D and 3D. It lets me do all this stuff inside After Effects. The other thing that I can bring out of C4D is a depth pass, which means I can bring in depth of field effects and atmospheric effects and that sort of thing. So it worked pretty well. We used it on about 10 shots in the film. Um, in fact, the director liked it, but he said at one point, it doesn't look graphic enough. It looks too much like a visual effects shot. So dial it back, make it look more graphic. So here's one more look at the ad. You can look for that for those shots. So that's our Predator Instinct ad, uh, which we made last year for Adidas. Thanks very much. OK, so that's a couple of projects we've been working on recently. I'm now going to do something a little bit different and do um, a quick demo of um, a new business software that's uh, come out as a plugin for C4D, which is the Arnold Renderer. Now, the Arnold Renderer is, like a lot of different plugins for C4D, is basically an external third-party renderer um, that gives us another way of outputting our C4D uh, models and textures. Um, working at MPC, our, our 3D department already uses Arnold. Um, however, uh, my motion design department, or the motion design department where I work, is not using Arnold yet. So um, it's something that we're in the process of changing over to. We're very excited about it. So I'm going to take you through some things now and show you um, what I think is so great about it. I'm going to um, rebuild this image here. Um, now, this is a uh, a scene I built when I started testing Arnold. Um, Arnold now have taken that and they've built a tutorial around it. So if you download the demo for Arnold, uh, you can actually go into the user guide and you can find this tutorial and follow along in the steps. Um, but I'm going to do a little bit of a walkthrough now. So this is the scene that I built in Cinema 4D. It's extremely simple. If I look at it from a distance here, this is my globe scene. Um, it's made up of two planes. Uh, they're both wrapped. They have a wrap deformer on them. That's what makes them look like spheres. The larger one is the Earth surface, and the smaller one is the cloud surface. And I'm going to texture and light this now using Arnold. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a physical sky. So a physical sky in Arnold is um, a simulation, a procedural simulation of a realistic daylight, sunlight lighting. So I just go to Plugins, C4D to A, C4D to Arnold, grab a sky. Now, this on itself isn't actually textured. It's just basically a big dome around the, around the planet. Um, this is the same thing you'd use for using HDRIs or anything like that. 
I'm going to create a new material, Arnold. Uh, let's see, Arnold Texture Environment, Physical Sky. If I open up my Arnold Sky over here, you can see this over here. I have this um, different types of values. This one there, it says constant. That just means it's going to be a constant color. If I change that to link, then I have a slot here where I can drop in this physical sky. So I'm just going to do that now. And now all the controls of my physical sky are going to come from this shader over here. They're pretty simple, really. And that's one nice thing about Arnold. A lot of the controls are actually very simple. Um, so to see what that's doing, I'm just going to close this. And I'm going to open up something called the Arnold IPR. You can see my old image there. It's going to render the new one here in a second. Um, while it does that, I'll explain what the IPR is. Uh, I believe IPR stands for Interactive Progressive Renderer. And what this is is like a real-time renderer inside C4D. Now you can see there's my scene. This is my physical sky up in the top. This is my planet. It hasn't got any texture on it yet. Um, it will do soon. So the IPR is an extremely helpful feature because it allows you to see what you're doing as you do it. You can see the effects of lights and textures as you build them. Right, so now that I've done my sky, I'm going to start looking at the shader for my planet. What I want to do is create a shader that has uh, the color of the Earth, but also has uh, some reflection where the sea is. So I'm going to create a uh, uh, new surface texture in Arnold, just the standard material here. Now, the standard material in Arnold is um, pretty much the same material you'd use for just about anything, uh, except for skin or car paint, that sort of stuff. Open it up here. And at first glance, it looks a lot like a standard C4D material. You probably see some uh, channels you recognize, diffuse, specular, reflection. Where it really changes is where you, when you open up the shader network. Now, this is quite new for most of us using C4D. But if you've used, Arnold, uh, if you've used Maya or uh, Softimage, you might recognize this way of creating shaders. Uh, it's called the shading network. It's extremely powerful. It gives you the option of making very big changes very simply. Um, so if I click on this standard material here, you can see I have all these controls over on the right, or I used to. But I now have this big space here where I can start doing some, uh, creating some nodes, connecting some nodes to create my material. Everything in here flows from left to right, comes in through this standard material, and out through this little port here. So first thing I need to do is bring in an image, which would be my Earth. So I'm going to go Image. I'm going to drag in this node here. And this is where I can load in uh, any bitmap, like I normally would into C4D. So uh, if I click on this little dialog here for importing, it brings up this little list. I'm just going to click on uh, Earth Color TX. I'm going to hit Open. There's going to be a moment while um, it brings it in. I'm not on an extremely powerful computer here. You'll see it'll beach ball here in a second. But I'm going to explain what these TX files are as I do it. TX is a specific file format that Arnold uses that vastly improves the efficiency of high-resolution images. What it does is it breaks down the image into very small tiles. And at any render time, or at any point, it can figure out which of those tiles it actually needs to load into memory and which ones it doesn't. The way you create text files, TX files, is inside the plugin. I've already done it, but if you use the plugin, you'll see there's a manager that creates these files for you. So the next thing I'm going to do is just connect that image into my shader. So if I click, stick on my, click on my standard material over here, you can see I have all these different uh, controls here. What I can do is um, replace those controls with things that are happening in the, standard, in the network here. So notice how I, um, if I go into the standard material and I create a new port here, uh, diffuse color, and I pipe this output of my image into diffuse color, whoops, missed. That diffuse color chip went away from over there. But now I've created this connection here. And if I get this out of the way, call up the IPR. I need to apply that material, by the way. Drag that onto my Earth and hide my clouds. Give this a second. In a moment, we should see my Earth material on there. There you go. OK. So now it's loaded in that Earth material. You can see it's doing a kind of it's constantly improving render here. What it's doing is it's starting with no anti-aliasing. And as, it's, uh, as you're sitting doing nothing, it's constantly improving that. As soon as I change something, it's going to go back to that grainy image, but it's very quickly going to start to improve it. So that's my color of my Earth. What I need now to do is create a reflection on the sea. Okay? So I'm going to go back into my um, material editor here. And I'm going to bring in another image. So I can just drag and drop this image node here. Whoops. 
And I'm going to load in another TX file. This one's called uh, Earth Mask. And while that loads in, I'll explain what that image is. I think it's going to, uh, yeah. That is just a black and white image. It's black where there is sea and white where there is land. So I'm going to pipe that into my reflection, in this case, a specular channel, to tell Arnold where I want it to be reflective and where I don't. Just another minute for this to load in. OK, so I'm going to create another port here in my standard material. This is um, specular weight. And this is just basically where it's specular, where are we getting reflection. And I pipe this into there. I'm going to try to. There we go. Specular weight. Now, if I look at my IPR, you can see it's not done exactly what I want. It's made the land reflective, and the sea has made it black. The reason for that is that the uh, map that I brought in is actually the inverse of what I want. But that's no problem. I can change that inside my shader network. I just collect, uh, basically, I'm going, to in I'm going to add a new node in between here. So I'm going to go ramp, whoops, ramp RGB. And this is just a gradient ramp. And I'm just going to port my, mas my gradient, uh, sorry, my land mask into this then back out through the other side. And if I look in here, it hasn't done what I wanted yet, but that's because these controls are still set to red and blue. What I want to do is set them to white and black. And there we go. Effectively, what that's done is it's taken that black and white image, and it's remapped the colors to that gradient based on the brightness. And in fact, in this case, it's just swapped them around. Black becomes white, white becomes black. So if you look at my uh, Earth now, it's starting to work a bit. I'm starting to get some reflection on the sea. Um, and my land is staying exactly as it was. Now, what I want to do is get a nice big sun reflection off my planet. Normally, this would take a lot of work, because I'd have to constantly change the position of the physical sky, change the settings of the physical, physical sky, and then hit render and see what happens. In this case, I can see it all happening right here in the IPR. So if I go into my physical sky, just start playing with these settings. So I'm going to change the uh, elevation. That's how far up in the uh, sky the sun is. I'm going to change that to something like uh, 30. I'm going to change my azimuth, which is the other big setting, to 180. And you can see suddenly I've got a very bright reflection on my Earth's surface. Now, I don't want it to be quite so bright, so I'm going to change a couple of things. I'm going to go back into my standard material. You remember I mapped that specular weight from um, black to white. Basically, this white is where it's the most reflective. I'm just going to change that to um, something quite closer to gray, like that. And if I look in the IPR, you can see now I've got this nice sun reflection on the planet. Now I can play with other settings. For instance, I can look at my specular roughness, which is basically how shiny it is. Just get this down here. Specular roughness is this control here. If I make it like this, I'll get a very sharp, bright reflection. If I move it over here, I get a much softer reflection. I'm just going to move it back to where it was. I think we're somewhere around here. OK. So you can see the IPR gives me a lot of uh, control and a way to view um, what I'm doing very quickly. And that's really useful when you're doing things like um, refining a specular highlight, which can be very sensitive to small changes. So that's my Earth surface. Uh, now I want to bring in my clouds. So I'm going to create another material, Arnold Surface Standard. And I'm going to bring in another image. So just type image here. OK, and this is where I want my cloud image. So I'm just going to go into here, Clouds TX. OK, while this loads in, this is a uh, high resolution satellite composite image I created using lots of different satellite maps. Uh, of clouds, and um, it's pretty detailed. Oh, sorry, it's a beach ball in there. So just taking a minute. So what it's doing here is actually loading in the TX file into RAM. I believe if you load a normal um, JPEG or a TIFF in here, it won't take so long. But this has the big uh, effect of making the IPR more responsive because you're using a TX file and also making your renders faster. So I want a uh, diffuse color. I'm going to put that into there. OK. And I'm going to turn on my clouds and apply that texture. 
It'll take a minute for the IPR to load in all that new image. Um, but as soon as it does, you'll see, OK, now I've got clouds, but they've blocked out my Earth. So what I need to do is change the opacity of that cloud layer. That's pretty easy. I can just take that image and use it as its own kind of luma key. Arnold doesn't do alpha channels as we know it, but it does understand transparency. So if I create another input here, I just go into refraction, opacity, and I just pipe that same image in there. Okay. Once I've done that, you can see over in the IPR, now I have some very thin, wispy clouds. Um, I want those clouds to be a little bit denser, so that's easy. I'm just going to add a color correct node in between uh, so that it affects the version of that image that's affecting the opacity. So I'm just going to go here, go color. There's that color correct node. Drop that in there, create an input. Now, nothing's changed yet, but as soon as I start playing with things like exposure, notice how my clouds suddenly get really dense. So this is a very quick way of controlling this setting and seeing, uh, dialing up the values that I want to get the nicest look. Change the gamma a little bit and get a slightly different feel from my clouds. So that's the clouds as I want them to look. Now I'm going to use something called displacement to make them nice and fluffy and bumpy. And displacement inside Arnold is very powerful, and it's also very quick. So basically, I'm just going to take that same image that I've been using for my clouds, pop it down here into Arnold displacement, and suddenly, these clouds, if you look very carefully, once it's figured this out, are going to become all bumpy because it's using the, image, the information in that image to puff up the clouds. But it's, at the same time it's doing that, it's subdividing them. It's turning them into a much higher resolution geometry. The way I know that it's doing that is by looking over here on my Arnold tag. The Arnold tag is kind of a one tag fits all. It does whatever it does based on uh, what you've applied it to. Put it on a camera, it comes up with settings for a camera. Put it on geometry, it comes up with settings for geometry. So I look over here and I can see in my subdivision that it's dividing this object in, uh, subdividing this object four times prior, prior to applying this displacement. Um, over here in the displacement, I can see how far I'm displacing it. And that just means it's bumping it up by that luminance by uh, one and a half centimeters, which in the scale of my scene is fine. In the long run, this is going to give me much nicer little clouds because they're going to have all that little detail in there. One other thing I can add to this is a little bit of subsurface scattering, which will make it feel like there's some uh, light bouncing around inside those clouds. So I'm just going to make those slightly orange to pick up on the color of the sky. A bit saturated and change the weight here to something like uh, 0.2. It's a subtle difference, but you can see the clouds are picking up that little bit of subsurface uh, color, and suddenly those little bumps are becoming a lot more detailed. I've got one more effect I'm going to add, which is my overall atmosphere. And I'm going to do that with one more piece of geometry. So I'm just going to take this cloud object, duplicate it, and call it um, Atmos. It's got a wrap deformer on it. I'm going to make that bigger so that this layer sticks out on top of all my clouds. Set to 501, I'm going to set it to 505. Okay. Now at the moment, that's got the same cloud material on it, so I'm just going to hide it while it does that. So yet again, new material. And um, this one is going to have a special shader on it. So still going to go for the standard material. Okay. In C4D, we often use a sh shader called Fresnel, which defines color based on the angle of the facing the camera. In Arnold, we have something similar. It's called facing ratio. There it is. Okay. And I'm going to set this to, um, for now, I'm just going to set it to diffuse color. Pop it here. I'm going to switch off the IPR for a second just so that I can see my real time render here. You can see this shader here, it's white in the middle where it's facing the camera, and it's gray and black on the sides where it's facing away from the camera. I want the opposite effect here. So I'm just going to go over here and click Invert. Now you can see it's black in the middle and white near the sides. And what I want is a really kind of cranked up version of that. So I'm just going to up this bias here. You see that's changing that value there. And then crank up the gain. Let's get these both really high. And I think I'm going to need to, actually, let's try that. Let's go for that. 
OK, so now it's bright on the outside, but black in the middle. Basically, I just want to um, add this on top of my scene to create a kind of hazy atmosphere. So I've got this Atmos object here. I've got my new shader down here. And I am going to pop that on there. Now, before I do that, I'm going to change. Um, I don't want this applied to the diffuse color. I want this to a cast out light. So I'm going to change this to emission. OK. Actually, not to emission, but emission scale. Take my diffuse color down to nothing. So now we've got a really glowy outline like a halo. So when I start to bring this into my scene, first thing it's going to do is just cover everything else up. Turn on the IPR again. It'll take a minute for it to load this in. I think it's coming. There we go. OK, so you can see that looks a lot like the kind of uh, atmosphere of the Earth seen from space. But of course, it's blacking out my image again. So what I'm going to do is take that same bright image and pump that into the opacity. And there we go. You can see it now feels like a kind of hazy atmosphere sitting on top of the Earth. So actually it looks a bit bright here. I'm going to dial it down a little bit. It's a little bit more contrasty on my laptop here. And if I want, I can use the uh, ramp RGB shader to add a bit of color to this. So just grab one of these. You notice it's gone red on the edges and blue in the middle. I can just change these colors. It's basically this blue I can change to black. And this red I can change to something like uh, the blue atmosphere of the planet. And there you go. OK. Uh, it's not ready for a feature film, but you can see how using these different shaders together can pretty quickly um, create something that feels fairly realistic. Um, give this a minute for this to load up. Uh, it's still going through the IPR, but um, when it refines a little bit, when it uh, tightens up, sharpens up, it um, should look pretty good. That's all I've got for today. Uh, does anybody want to ask any questions? Okay. Thanks very much.